Now that No Time to Die has been out for a while, let's have a spoiler-filled discussion of the movie. Everything we've done to this point has been non-spoiler. So again, there are spoilers in this conversation. Hi, this is Tom Pizzato. Dan Silvestri. I'm Vicki Hodges. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. So let's start taking apart the movie No Time to Die with some spoilers. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's go! I wanted to start this by talking about Vicky and I did an initial reaction podcast. We, I went to England and saw the movie with her and we had just seen the movie for the first time. We had all the hype building up to the movie and on the first viewing, we actually both liked it. Yeah. Now on that podcast, Vicky, if you remember, you said it will certainly take a few viewings. Yes. How, how prescient, right? You've seen it what? Three times now? Three times. Yeah. And Dan, you've seen it twice, right? Yeah. Okay. And I've seen it five times. All right, that's a lot of times. It's too many times. <laughs> the first four times, let me put out the podcast we did on the discussion of the viewing formats in the theater, the 3D versus IMAX versus the standard, you know, that kind of stuff. And then I watched it again today before we did this recording to validate my thoughts as I was watching it. Because for me, unusually, each time I watch this movie, I liked it less and less. I liked it a lot at the beginning. It's a really good action movie, but as I've seen it this number of times, I don't think it's a very good James Bond movie. So at a high level, what do you guys think about that? I would agree with that. I really liked it on the first viewing. Um, yes, I was shocked by the end, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But I found that when I watched it second and third time, particularly the third time, I felt that it was dragging and I was sort of waiting for the end. I don't know if well, it's is that because I, you knew I knew end? what was coming. Yeah. It, I, I, you know, it just it just felt long and laboured for me. <laughs> that final <Okay>. time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. In terms of high level, it's high level production, and I think that's where it stops. The production of this thing is first rate. Everything they do is first rate in the film. They do throw it all on the screen, like Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman said in the beginning. Put it all on the screen, and they put it all on the screen. I've seen it twice now. I liked watching it on demand because you could stop it and you could actually get a lot more out of the movie itself because you could see, you could pay attention to the background stuff. You can rewind it. You could say, okay, I missed that. And you miss a lot of stuff when you're seeing it in the theater. There's no question. I saw an IMAX first and then this. Multiple viewings, I've only seen it twice, but the second time, I'm not as thrilled as I was the first time. So I agree with that. Uh, the reasons are one it's it's long and it's long the yes. second time <laughs> and two yes. try watching it five times <laughs> there's a lot of bond stuff in it and there's a lot of bond stuff not in it and i have some issues with that now we wanted to get morgan lisney's opinion of the movie he's a longtime james bond fan and the winner of the 2020 james bond international trivia marathon put on by stephen j rubin the author of the james bond movie encyclopedia and hosted by us. So, here's Morgan's two-minute summary. Morgan listening here with my review of No Time to Die. Well, we certainly waited a long time for this one, so begs the question, was it worth it? I've seen this film five times now, and my feelings are mixed. There are certainly a lot of Bond tropes that entertain enough. The pre-title sequence is good, the titles are good, along with Billie Eilish's song, Hans Zimmer's score is okay, not David Arnold quality, but certainly better than the last two scores by Thomas Newman. The action sequences are good, as is the cinematography. Craig gives a great performance as usual. Leah Sadu's Madeline is good, being further developed since Spectre, showing her backstory in the pre-title sequence. I love Jeffrey Wright as Felix and the bar scene. I thought the Safin character, though, uh, a little weak, along with his backstory. Somehow, I just didn't feel he was a worthy adversary for Bond, despite all the Dr. Noah-style references. Plus, he was very soft-spoken and it was hard to hear him clearly. Also, the idea that Blofeld is able to have a pie on a guy while in prison was a little far-fetched, as his plot point was never fully explained. I like the Primo character and the Cuba sequences with Paloma. Moni was very good as 007. Loved the scene where she kills Orbachev. I wish they had utilized Blofeld better. Maybe had him break out of prison and run things from the Poison Island, perhaps having Safin as his main henchman. 
Love the elements of the book. You only live twice, but thought there wasn't enough. I wanted more. The use of Honor Majesty's Secret Service dialogue and music is very good, especially near the end, which was deeply emotional. This is the most divisive Bond film in history, so it's going to take me, and I think fans in general, longer to fully digest and rate where it fits in all time. Right now, for me, it's currently in the middle of my Craigslist. With their scorched earth approach, Eon will be rebooting again. I think they should start with Bond in the Royal Navy. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for letting me share my thoughts on No Time to Die. Thanks, Morgan. Great insights. Okay, so we will let Morgan's summary frame the rest of our discussion. All right, Tom, let's get started with our specific take on the important parts of No Time to Die and whether we like them or not and why. We can get into that. Yeah. Now, we're setting this up that there's parts that we don't like, so let's let's actually start with some of the good stuff. There is some good stuff in this movie. And so, you know, I've, I've talked about I've seen it five times. I wouldn't have seen it the fifth time if I absolutely hated it. Yeah. yeah, there's that. But not everything was was terrible. I mean, it is a good action movie. I think they do a pretty good job with that. No question. It's the, an action acting, adventure movie. <laughs> yeah. The acting and production value is really good. Yep. Except maybe the chase in Norway, but I'll I'll talk about that when we talk about the action. Um, I do wish that we hadn't seen most of the best stunts in the trailers. The and tra- I know they were yes. saying, yeah. they, they had a problem because of the pandemic. Yep. Right? They, they put out interest. the first trailer because they were doing the ramp up to the movie and then everything got put on hold. They had to do some new content, which I think hurt. Um, yeah, we basically just, saw everything in the trailer. We, we saw a lot. Right. In the trailers. <laughs> I mean, there, we saw a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Dan, this is something that I think you and I are a little bit in disagreement in, in a bit is I like all the callbacks to the earlier Bond movies in this one. Yeah. And they do that throughout the se- the whole Bond series, n- not just the Daniel series, but they've done that throughout the whole Bond series. They, but they've I've done seen, it, yes. Like, no, they've done it in the past, and they've done it intentionally, like the Lazenby one, for instance, where mm-hmm. they wanted you to know that this is the same guy. This is James Bond. This is not some substitute. It's not somebody we're calling James Bond. And so on. And they referenced Goldfinger and all the, all the ones before Lazenby. But connecting it in terms of them being uh, missions that had occurred before. Now, we see this. And we have a conflict here because they have a ton of throwbacks here and callbacks, right? And Absolutely. You, you're thinking, hey, they're not really pretending all this stuff happened before. They're just in, in they're being the, nice. In the James Bond <laughs> world, I think it's just the tip of the cap to respecting given how they end this thing i mean quite honestly they could have they could end the series now right? <laughs> i think with, they the way, have. with the way they did that they really could end it yeah and i think this was just the tip of the cap in case that's what they do i mean remember fleming wanted to kill him off well uh, it was on it was unclear but it, uh, from russia with no, love I mean, he, he did want to kill him off and they talked him out of it and he wrote the next book well certainly doyle sir arthur conan doyle with sherlock yeah. holmes for sure clearly yeah. but I think here, uh, I don't think they're just nods. <laughs> I think they have to have some connective tissue there, and that's what they were doing. But there's some issues. <laughs> they have issues. What, what are your thoughts there, Vicky? Well, I'm actually in agreement with you, Tom. I actually just think they're paying homage to previous Bond films. And I think as if you're a prolific Bond fan, you sort of are like, oh, that's that, and... Yes, that's the car from that, and mm-hmm. and the the you know, um, I mean, one of the ones I picked upon was I don't I don't know if, if many people noticed, but the the man with the golden gun, when he was in the um that the hallways, there was the white like lights that kept coming yes. up, and that's the same as the fun house in the man with the golden right. gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and I I just think they're paying homage. The only one that I really have an issue with is you have all the time in the world. I yeah. don't think they should have used that. Right. For me, that film is special on Her Majesty's Secret Service, mm-hmm. and I think they should have come up with a new concept, a new song, a new uh, something for this film, not that particular film. Yeah. The pro- well, let me, let me stop the you only for one, one se- issue Let with. me stop you for one second on that, because you just said you have all the time in the world. Right. The song is We Have All the Time in the World, at the beginning of the movie, he says, we have all the time in the world. Yes. Yeah. And at the end, he says, you have all the time in the world. Yeah. And I don't like that line, how he I, says that. I cringe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's that. a lot of issues with this thing. 
yeah. because I, I believe in this homage thing. That's great. They've done it before, but they've done it before in pre-title sequences. They've done it before with showing you images in the title sequences, actually, and so on. Here, he's actually using the physical items. He's using the DB5. He's using the Aston Martin from the 1987 movie. He's using materials that were in other movies. So I have an issue with that. But, but and, and this all the time in the world thing or? really pisses me off. Daniel Craig drives a DB5 early. I mean, part of the whole thing about this is the Daniel Craig thing. It was supposed to be a, a reboot. Yeah, I know. Does that mean none of the other stuff happens? So you shouldn't bring in the car. You shouldn't bring in the people. Well, he wins the car in Casino Royale. So, I mean, that's legitimate. Right. Right. But, but, but you know, And the people. But it, to me, it's kind of like, where does it go? But I also liked how some of this stuff was really subtle. Yes. Like the, the mask that Safin wears at the beginning is a Japanese no mask. Yeah. So is that a tip of the cap to Dr. No? I mean, very subtle, <laughs> but I kind of mm. liked it. Maybe. I, I like the subtlety of, of the of these images rather than if you, we, we all know how we all feel about Die Another Day, but that was very much done in a comedic in your face style. Oh, the shoe with the, you know, right. when he's with Q. This is done very differently from yeah. that. Yeah. And, and I like the way they did do it in this film. It was subtle. But as I say, for me, the only one I have an issue with is just the the, the use of the song. Yeah, and, okay. and he's sitting in the car with her in the beginning, and mm-hmm. and he says to her, we have all the time of the world when she wants him to drive fast. Ah, we don't have to drive faster. We have all the time of the world, and the music's playing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and all of that's going on. And, I mean, really, how is that not a link to the previous movie and that the fact that he's... He's been married before. And really, if you're Bond, are you going to use that line again ever? When the last time you use it, your wife got killed? I, You know, well, this is the kind of stuff that bothers me. And that's But see, that's where, Dan, if the, if this is a cocoon, the whole Daniel Craig's... Yeah, they've created a, a problem. <laughs> if it's a cocoon, he never said, we have all the time in the world to get before, as far as we know. Mm-hmm. And that's this goes to my whole problem with Purvis and Wade in general. In this movie, you killed off Blofeld. Yeah. You killed off Spectre after spending a lot of money to get both of those back. <laughs> yeah. Right? To be able to use them. You kill off Lighter. You kill off Bond. Barbara and Michael, please, please, please kill off Purvis and Wade being your writers. Now, right? uh, look, in they, 2013, Purvis was quoted as saying, We've been doing it longer than Fleming with writing Bond. Yeah. Yet they don't seem to know who the hell he is or how to write one of these things. There's a problem here, and mm-hmm. and I I think that there's more issues than than just the two of them. The the whole concept of having this cocoon of Daniel Craig is is ridiculous. Yes. From the beginning, he's a double O agent. He's getting it in Casino Royale. He's getting his double O status. To he's old and retired, Inspector, and and in No Time to Die. That's a problem. They've right. painted themselves in a corner here that they're going to have a hell of a time getting out of now. And Purvis and Wade, if they continue writing, they can write all these people back in because they've guaranteed it cannot be the future. It has to be the past for Bond yeah, now. See, if Purvis and Wade are, are writing, I'm not going to watch any of it Well, anymore. they I'm could write in Spectre again. They could write in Blofeld again. They could write in Felix Leiter again. They could write in whatever they want again because it has to have happened in the past before they're all dead. So. Do you guys think that Bond's uh, character had dramatically changed? Absolutely. Yeah, and that's a he problem. Was not even a shadow of what. Vicky, uh, I'm, I'm I'm a purist. I like the women, the cars, the drink, you know, all that. And there was, he was like a family man, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It just didn't. That's it. Just didn't. That's. I, I like the struggle in the beginning where, and, and it is a struggle, it, it's a challenge to release the past and embrace the future. And I love that in the mm-hmm. beginning where they're, yeah. they're walking to the hotel and they're bringing up the luggage and the fire, the, the, the little paper flips are fire are, are on fire and burning. And, and, and they ask the guy, well, what is that? And he's like, what are they burning? He says, secrets, wishes, letting go of the past, getting rid of the old things and in come the new. And that's all about Bond and Madeline. And, you know, he, she's even criticizing him for looking over his shoulder like, hey, you know, there's nobody coming. What are you worrying about? That part I really love because that is a challenge and would be a challenge for a guy who's coming out of the Secret Service and now trying to live a life that's normal. That part I thought was brilliant. That that was terrific. 
and they continue it when they're in bed. Oh, the, the past is not dead. You have to let go, she's telling Bond. And that's why he goes to the Acropolis and burns his little note, forgive me, in front of Vesper's thing. So I love that. That part was terrific and and reasonable and believable that that would happen. A lot yeah, see, of the other in, stuff... In, in terms of the change of the Bond character, like. though? Yeah. Right? You've got... Would Bond really be sitting there in the car while they're pelting the car with bullets, well, not doing anything yeah. before he does the donut stunt? I have, like, a, I have an issue with that too, Tom, and I, yeah. I as you do, and I'm sure Vicky yeah. does too. To me, when you look at his face, when they're, when they're, pe- and you could see the, gl- the, the bulletproof glass buckling a little, like hey, you keep yeah. shooting the same spot in bulletproof right. glass, you're going to get through it eventually. Right. And Especially he's with sitting, a gun like that. <laughs> yeah, and he's sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> to me, you look at his face and it looks like he has given up. He didn't well, care whether they shot through the car or not, killed her or not, killed him or not. At that moment, it looked like he didn't give a damn. And that's not Bond. Right. I don't and we care. we see it again right at the end of the movie. Yeah, and I don't, yeah. Care, I don't care what you struggle through in your life and everything else. People have a very difficult time changing. And mm-hmm. he wouldn't have changed in three years, five years, whatever, the fundamental character of his personality. And here they're showing us like, eh, I don't give a shit. I'm Bond. I don't give a shit if we die, live, whatever. Mm. That was a problem for me. Vicky, what do you think of that part? I, I just think uh, in similar that Bond wouldn't, he'd find a way out of a situation. Yeah. He yeah. wouldn't just sit there and just, and, and it's, and like Tom said, it's reflected at the end. There'd be some way. He wouldn't just stand there and wait for, to be hit with. Well, but he was also in a Sophie's <laughs> Choice scenario at the end. Because if he got off the island, eventually, even if he never saw Madeline and Matilda again, eventually they would die if he got off the island with the way the nanobots worked. Yeah. Right? Eventually, it would, it would route around to where it got and killed them. Right? You know, because it's, you know, they, he shakes hands with somebody or whatever and it rubs off and then they have the, 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 the DNA, yeah. though, and it has to be programmed for that. There are some issues with well, that, no, too. But, that, but that's what that's what the whole blood vial thing in the fight with Safin at the end is it's all a, about. It's, it's a hair. It's a it's a fo- hair follicle. Well, but well, that's but then he, he's got it mixed with blood, and it looks so like that, it's mixed with blood. But he never yeah. says it's blood. He says it's a hair yeah. follicle from Madeline. Yeah. So but it's suspended in something. And yeah, it could be suspended in something to preserve it and whatever. Yeah. But that's the tie bond with them, and that your DNA with their DNA is a problem. You can't touch them. You can't be with them. You can't whatever with them. Well, no, he can't. He can't. However, here's my island. problem. Here's my problem again. The end, like Vicky just said. Well, wait, wait. Let's not do the end now. Let's. We got a long time to. Let's do the end at the end. <laughs> yeah, let's do the end at the end. Yeah. I've got, I've got a couple other points in this movie where I, I saw Bond not be Bond. Oh, yeah. When Felix dies, we get a very different reaction than with Mathis dies in and, and Quantum. And in Quantum, he was, you know, towards the end there, he was really good. It seemed like good friends with Mathis. Oh, he was good friends. So, so the reaction was very different there. Now, granted, Jeffrey Wright's lighter was in three of Daniel Craig's five Bond movies. Yeah. And Mathis was only in two. Yeah. So there might have been a stronger Bond there. But we actually saw more, I think, of Mathis than we've seen of lighter. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure. There's the scene with Madeline in, in Norway where he's giving her this speech about loving her. And it's like, you know, the for what felt like five minutes of my life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now when I hear that, I'm almost vomiting. I mean, this <laughs> is not James, but that's not how Bond talks. Yeah. Or at least the way the Bond I know talks. Yeah, they, like I said, people don't change. Yeah, easily. I mean, you have to really work hard to change any kind of personality characteristic you have. It yeah. doesn't happen easily. It's like an alcoholic. It doesn't. It do, you can't change quickly. It takes a lot of work, and it would take a lot of work for Bond to change his fundamental personality. And he's completely different in this movie. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. I agree. It's yeah. Well, it's shocking. And his whole groveling to uh, Safin. Now, that may have just been the ploy to be able to... I don't think that... I, yeah, I agree. I disagree with that. He was not groveling. He was not begging for mercy. He was not doing anything. He was getting his gun prepared and hidden so he could pull that out and do something. So I don't... I There have been a lot of talk about that. Oh, he's bowing and everything. No, he's he's in control there. He, there he is, Bond. He's, he's figuring okay. out what the hell to do. 
I actually like that scene, but I've got distracted watching it a number of times. If you watch closely on one of the uh, parts of that scene, the camera is on Daniel Craig, and Safin is talking off screen, but Daniel Craig is mouthing Safin's lines, and it completely ruins it now for me. Yes. Yeah. It is very, very. <laughs> yeah. Why was he doing that? I didn't notice that. He's just that. Like, yes, I noticed it the first time. Yes. But I thought I said to uh, I said to my husband, I said, like, watch out for this," and he agreed. It was there. Oh my god, <laughs> I, I missed that. I got to go back and look at it tonight, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. You watch that scene closely. Yeah, it just ruined it because I actually thought that was quite a good scene, but that now ruins it. Why the heck would they leave that in? Yeah. I mean. All right. Right. Let's let's shift because we're we're back at the end of the movie again. Let's get back towards the beginning. <laughs> All right, because a couple things in here that I I did like. And mm. one was when he goes to the cemetery and you've got the picture of Vesper on the grave. Yeah. Now, at least here in the graves graveyards that I've been to, the cemeteries I've been to, you don't see a lot of pictures of the person. No. Now, when but I went to when I went to Italy, I was back say. to where my family's from. Yeah, they do that. Every grave had some, their picture on it. You'll see a lot of Italian graves here with pictures on it. I I have seen that too. So yes, that's true. Yeah. So I, I so I, I thought that was a, that was neat because to me that really felt I was in Italy. Yeah. When you saw that, why she's buried in Italy and I don't know, but <laughs> yes, I haven't quite worked that one out. Uh, yeah. I'm still yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then and then of course Bonds, I miss you at the grave. If you think about Roger and for your eyes only when he goes to the grave, he mm-hmm. says nothing to her. Yeah. Here you get the yeah. sappy I've got to say something bond. Yeah. That's not a quippy line. Yeah. That's just really sappy. Now, the intriguing part of this is For Your Eyes Only was Roger Moore's fifth Bond film mm-hmm. when he goes to Tracy's grave. Yeah. And this was Daniel Craig's. Ah, yes, yes, <laughs> Not sure that there's supposed to be a tie in there, but yeah. it kind of felt that way to me. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. well, that's good. That, that's a good one. And uh, mm-hmm. there were a lot of sappy moments. And, you know, emotions are like that, though. I, you, you can't discount Bond being emotional. He's a human mm-hmm. being. So some of it I'm I'm okay with, but there was too much of that yeah. sap. Can I just get your guys' thoughts on Matilde and her... I'm actually fine with it. added to the to the film. Yeah, I, I'm fine with her because of the way they had to get the Sophie's Choice thing kind of going. It's either them or me. I mean, Sophie's Choice isn't them or me. It's this one or that one, but it's the same kind of thing. And so mm-hmm. I, it, how it, normally Bond wouldn't give a damn if if Madeline died. I don't think, you know, off of this thing. But now that his offspring is there. You know, plus, I mean, you got to figure as many women as he yeah, slept with. I did like how he looked uncomfortable and, and didn't really know what to do or say around yeah. the child, you know, yeah. which is yeah. like completely new to him. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were some uh, cute he, parts he of that. Looked at the, sorry, the, the, there was a part, is it when he speaks to Nomi and he says, this is uh, uh, like almost to say like my family, but he, he, he can't seem to, the way he says it, he, he looks in disbelief himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that was the right scene. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were, there were some moments in there that were cute, and he's peeling the apple for Matilda and so on. She did a terrific job, by the way. She was awesome in terms of mm. her acting ability in this thing. She was terrific, <laughs> yeah. I thought. And uh, But that peeling the apple thing, I mean, that's pretty sappy, and it's pretty... But you can see where Bond would be totally uncomfortable, like, mm. like I don't know what I'm doing. Huh? And, right. and you can see his face waiting for the reaction from Matilda. Did she like it or not like it, you know? And, well, and again, and what, asks, what I think is probably the best line in the movie was when she says, I've got a surprise for her. I got something to show you. Yeah. I said, whatever it was, and he goes, another child. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you saw some humor here that yeah. generally from the Craig uh, era, you hadn't seen a lot of humor. And yeah. But him having a child, that I, I really don't have a bridge. problem with that because he, with as many women as he sleeps with, it's likely to happen. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. no, I don't have, have so much of a, an, an issue with that as as opposed to the ending and, and, and more of you, but yeah. No, I want to go back to the grave because there's two more things I want to talk about at the grave. Yeah. And one is the muddied audio that happens after the explosion. Yeah. And he's yeah. kind of, and I was okay with it. My wife was like, what the hell is that? And But, you know, I was like, okay with it the first time, but they repeated the the trick stunt whatever you want to call it where you had that same kind of an audio mix towards the end and i i think that actually cheapened what happened at the beginning 
Because I thought mm-hmm. it worked at the beginning because he's coming yeah. out of it and you're coming out of it with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was then, a repeat. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things I did like is the, and we talked about this in another podcast, uh, Tom, early on with one of the trailers, when the bell is ringing when he's doing the donuts yep. with the car. And yep. the bell is tolling in the church yes. uh, steeple. And yep. we talked about it then, and it's worth bringing up again now. This bell is really a throwback to For Whom the Bell Tolls from Hemingway. Obviously, right. they had the Hemingway connection in License to Kill and so on at the Hemingway House mm-hmm. and yeah. Farewell to Arms and so on. Here, I think, hi- historically, when a church bell rang, it meant someone died. A parishioner, a member of the congregation, someone in in the congregation died. And people hearing the bell would wonder who died and wonder for whom the bell tolls. And so this, I thought, was brilliant. If they actually thought this, <laughs> then I think it's brilliant because for me, it was obvious. It's like, man, right. this, is, this is a bell tolling. Yes. It's for whom the bell tolls. It's signifying there's going to be a major problem for Bond in this movie and it happens. And I think even the, the, the graveyard scene that we were just talking about, Tom and Vicky, mm-hmm. a bell tolls in the distance then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, I that part, I thought, that's a part I really liked. I really mm-hmm. thought was terrifically done and well-intentioned if that's what they were trying mm-hmm. to connect with. Mm-hmm. Do not no, ask I, for I whom the bell you. tolls. Yeah. Yeah. It tolls for the, it tolls for all of us, all of us Bond fans. <laughs> that's yep. who the bell tolls for. <laughs> <laughs> now, when when Bond was standing at the at the mausoleum or grave, whatever you want to call it, with Vesper. Yeah. Did you notice the eight, the the age range that she had? Yeah, so, it said two thousand six. Six, which was be when Casino was. It yeah. said that she was born in nineteen eighty three. Okay. So that would make her what twenty three. So you I, had I, you know an older Bond with this twenty three year old. Now Ava Green, the actress, was born in nineteen eighty. Yeah. Daniel Craig was born in nineteen sixty eight. So you would think that if they had given her the right age, it, they would have been a little bit closer. But also with all the callbacks back to On Her Majesty's Secret Service, if they had made Vesper's birth year be 1980, mm-hmm. she would have died the same age as Tracy, who died when she was 26. Yeah. Which and would I, have I been a 20... great little, I, that would have been a great tie back for me. They missed a link there. With all the links they did, that would have been a good one. Yeah. <laughs> to, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we let's get back to some stuff we liked. All right. <laughs> Well, I'm going to say, I absolutely, and I will be honest, when we first watched it, me and Tom, mm-hmm. I mentioned that I didn't like Madeline Swan particularly. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I did think she was better in this film. But on the, the numerous viewings I've had of it, I actually think she did a darn good performance. Yeah. And I think the three women who were in this film were very well written and strong. Um uh, particularly, we've, we've got to mention Paloma. I mean, I think she was the highlight of the movie. Yay! <laughs> um, such, such a, uh, you know, she's she's going to go down as one of those those characters like uh, Naomi from the Spy Who Loved Me and yeah. Miss Caruso from uh, Live and Let Die. Yeah. You know, on screen for a very short time, but they made such a massive impact. Yeah, yeah. And you Absolutely. just really wish that there was more of her on screen. She was she was just brilliant. She she, she was like a breath of fresh air. I really did think she was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm totally with you on that with her. Yeah. And yeah. her character. Yeah. But Bond was not Bond. When they're no, in, I agree with that. when they're in that wine room, there's no way <laughs> The bond that I know would have told her to turn around. Yeah. And there's no way they yeah. wouldn't have ended up, you know, making out or going further in that scene. Yeah. For the bond I know. Yeah. The mm. turning around thing was ridiculous. Yeah. That, that, that wasn't fun. But that said, the whole Paloma thing, other than that, I totally dug. I yeah, thought it was yeah. great. Yeah. She was awesome. She, uh, and I'd she also really read good. that she Honor was added in perfect. after the movie was written. That, and I don't know how they did that because it was such an important scene to the movie yeah. with all the Spectre agents. Uh, Dan, Daniel Craig got her into the movie, didn't he, from Knives Out? I yeah, I think so, it. yeah. And so I, I, it'd be interesting to see the before Paloma stuff in yeah. the script for how they killed off the Spectre people 
versus mm-hmm. what they did with her. Because that what they did with her was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I I, I knock Purvis and Wade. I'll t- I'll tip my hat to that. Yeah, and I love how they set us up too. They set us up for her because she she's acting kind of immature. She says she's yes. only got three weeks training, and and they kind of set us up as okay, she's not going to be that good. And bam, she kicks ass and Bond's like, well, oh, I actually crap. think she was tipsy. I think she'd had quite a few drinks, you know. <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, but that's very Bond like. Yeah. She drank that martini pretty fast. Yeah, I mean, there's even a comment that, that Nomi makes about Bond when he says something, I haven't had a drink in three or four hours where they're going to yeah. shoot the, the smart blood in him. Right. And she's like, oh, that, that, that that's not normal or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And then you when they inject her with the smart blood, you're thinking, man, she's going to be this tough, tough agent. She goes, ow! Holy God, that hurt. You know, it's like, that surprised me too. It's like, okay, they set us up for that too. It's like, okay. I like I mean, that there's part. so much speculation around her character on social media, you mm-hmm. know, all sorts of things. And she wasn't portrayed how everybody was sort of thinking that she was going to be. And I, I just thought she was really good. And she provided a lot of humour between yes. her, the banter between her and Bond, yeah. I thought was, was, was really good. I, I liked the character. I thought she was she was excellent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did too. I, I thought she was good and, uh, and consistent, I think, throughout. She she played mm-hmm. a consistent character, which was good. It wasn't these ups and downs with her. It was she was straight, boom, and the same, which is hard to do. It's hard to do. Yeah. yeah. Hard to write them mm-hmm. too. So that was that was another good piece of writing. What did you guys think of Heracles, the main villain in this movie? Ah, uh, well, we've seen it. Well, first before. I love the name of it. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to the yeah. Greek mythology, protecting mankind, isn't he? Somebody? Yeah, he per- I mean his one of his Her- Heracles or Hercules as we know it here is you know he purged the world of evil and villains yeah so yeah. and that's what the whole nanobot stuff was supposed to do yeah i mean we've seen the chemical stuff before and all this this was a little more sophisticated in terms of the science of it and so okay i could i could go with that and think okay that's good heracles is a good name for it and mm-hmm. the concept is good i still don't know why he wants to kill millions of people he doesn't care i don't think he's just selling it maybe and making money from it but yeah, well, well, he wants okay. to play God. Yeah, he wants to decide who lives and dies. Yeah, well, yeah, he was just selling it to people who were going to decide yeah. who lives and dies. Yeah. But and, and so he did, he wasn't worried about it coming back to him too. So there's a, we have some other issues there. I mean, so that part I'm okay with. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what? Yeah, it's the fundamental, as as it's the fundamental <laughs> premise of the movie. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I just lo- I just love the name of it because of what yeah. these was. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that, we, yeah. Was, that was well done. What do you think of the scientist, Valdo? I liked him, actually. But, and I, I do know that there are people who found him annoying. He's been sort of linked with the Boris Grishenko of GoldenEye mm-hmm. type character. Yeah. But I, I actually thought he was sort of a bit of a, a sort of comic relief, really. <laughs> so, yes. You know, which is what they have in the Bond films, isn't it? And I thought, again, we've, yeah. we've got somebody in the film who, you know, he's sort of a yeah. one of those characters we've sort of not had for a while. I yeah. would yeah. say. I thought he was yeah. okay. I thought he was consistently annoying. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> I could see that I could see that as part of his character as being this nerdy scientist kind of guy that he would have that kind of nerdy presence and he's going to be consistent with it. And he was. So I was mm-hmm. okay with him. I've got to be honest with you. There was, uh, I think he was called Dr. Hardy. He was the, he was at the beginning. Yes. Yeah, um, like the, guy, and the other guy who gets he, shot. Yeah. He's Hugh, Hugh Dennis. He's a, he's, he's a TV star here in UK. So, that completely threw us at this uh-huh. end because we, we know him from comedy. So we, yeah. he, having him in there, sort of, all we kept thinking of is the shows that he'd been in. So to have somebody like that was, can be a bit off-putting sometimes. He's a comedian and a comedic, comedic actor. Yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, it was it's like, oh, what's he doing in this sort of thing, you know, and <laughs> for the time he was in it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, How about uh, Logan Ash? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually say, I, I've seen Billy Magnuson in a few films, and he has got this huge grin in a lot of the films I've seen him in. And he was probably cast well because he says that line, doesn't he, he um, when he keeps grinning all the time. I think he yeah. makes some remark, uh, Daniel uh, Bond does, about yeah. about him. So I, I didn't mind him, to be honest with you. I think, I, I don't, was I surprised he was a villain? I don't know if, if I was or not, but... <laughs> yeah, you know. I was not surprised he was a villain. I... 
found him a little too annoying to be some tough guy. He's grinning. Oh, I, I he kept saying the Bond. Oh, and I respected him so much, or I, whatever he said. He, it was something like that about Bond, that that was his... His, he, his hero. His hero. His, yeah. Like, oh, my God, I really respect everything you've done. And yet he was this kind of, you know, I don't know. He was too smiley, too... Too Again, he's, a, yeah, he's an actor who normally plays a comedic role, yes. uh, and I know he's got a very good singing voice because I've seen him yes. in a couple of musical films. Yes. So, yeah. I suppose in a way he was a, a not your typical choice for that that part, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, but I think I think it actually was a really good offset between Lighter and Bond, so that when they have to do those scenes together, mm-hmm. I thought that whole smiley I'm a big fan thing to me it really worked, and it led to one of my other favorite lines of this movie. Is when Bond says, "Where you know, where'd you get the Book of Mormon?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that was good. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, that was good. Now, Billy Billy Magnuson was not in, as far as I've been able to find, in the Book of Mormon. He was, however, and Vicky, this is going to the kind of parts he played. He was nominated for a Tony Award for his work on Broadway for a character named Spike in the play Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike. And Spike is this kind of goofy character, and mm. it works. And that character kind of to some degree gets brought over here yeah. into this movie. So I actually, I actually really liked the character and I loved the way they got rid of him too. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did like that. That was like old school bond. That was, yeah, that <laughs> was you know, it was, it was, a that was Roger Moore kicking the car think, over the cliff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do actually think he did actually look up to bond, even though he, yes. he was a villain. Yeah. Oh, he, he did. Yeah. I still think he, he did actually sort of, you know, it's even got that feeling in that Norway scene mm-hmm. that he, yes, you know, he, oh, yeah. he was sort of, he said it. Yeah. 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 It's like Bond okay. was his hero. <laughs> yeah. yeah, his really. hero. Yeah. So let's talk about the car chases. Since you brought up Norway, there was the car chase in Norway. There was the car chase and the motorcycle stuff at the beginning. What do you guys think of the chases? Uh, the one in Matera, just like you were mentioning earlier, I just think they showed you too much of that in the trailers and there wasn't mm-hmm. anything that we hadn't seen. Yeah, right. Um, I don't I really it, like the, the bridge. I, I thought, it, you know, thought it was all very good a good chase um i like the bridge swing thought yes. that was good but we'd seen it all there yep. wasn't anything we literally, literally did yeah <laughs> so it was yeah. like oh yeah that's that what we've seen already so yeah how about norway we, i actually thought it was it was different set in norway it was it was it, like a totally different setting with the sort of like the mist and the trees and we might <laughs> yes. Remind me very much of the Ewok village. I kept thinking of actually for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> when I watched it again in Star Wars. Um, yes. Well, I mean, um, yeah. I, 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 I thought it was different. It, it, that was different. I didn't dislike it. I didn't. Yeah, I, I, I liked it. I liked it. I thought it was good. But I, it was when I was watching it the first time, it reminded me of the Spy Who Loved Me. Like. Okay, it's going to be a hell. It's going to be a motorcycle. There's going to be cars chasing. There's a helicopter chasing you, and, and every they they worked all of those in to this chase as well. And I thought, okay, when's the helicopter? Oh, there's the helicopter. It's yeah. like, oh my god! And now we need a motorcycle, and there's the motorcycle. It's like, oh, uh, okay. So it was kind of new. The setting was new. Yeah. I like that, yeah. but we kind of saw the concept before and yeah see, and i think part of this was a little tip of the cap to steven spielberg we know that the spielberg and eon have put stuff in from each other's movies yeah to me the start of that thing when those those cars they come out of the forest just totally out of jurassic park feel to me a Jurassic Park. Oh, okay. and so and i'm wondering if that wasn't a tip of the cap to spielberg okay. i don't know Maybe. okay so then the car chases. Oh, by the way, the car chases. If you do watch this on 4DX, I talk about this in that. Uh, oh, I went. I did 4DX. Never again am I doing 4DX. No, I'm the same way. That, that, that's for an 18 year old. That's not for somebody my age. I know that. That scene, you're just thrown all over the place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like you know, if, if I wasn't watching it for what I was watching, you know, to do the podcast, I would have left because yeah. after the first chase, with as much as he got tossed around. Right. But that second one was really there's a lot of yeah yeah something going on there. So can right. I just mention the cars? Um, Absolutely. Of course we uh, we get the, the DB the DB five. I mean yeah. Is it time? Is it time to rest that car? I mean what? Yeah. It was, well, why not? You, you know, killed everything I mean, else it, off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah of course we had a very short snippet of 
the V8 from the uh, Living Daylight. Yeah. Um, and then we also had the Aston Martin Valhalla, which was really more like product placement. Yes, <laughs> it right. was just there. You gotta sell and some. Then, and then we had Nomi in the, oh, is it Super, the Super Lurga? Super, Super Lurga, yeah. Yes. The Aston Martin, yeah. Which looked a fantastic car, but yes. I mean, we didn't see anything on it. I'd like to have seen a bit more of that, you know. Mm. There just seemed to be product placements, those two particular yes. cars, yeah. I thought. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah in fact, there's never been so many cars, never been so many Astons in one film, has there? Yeah, yeah there's that's a lot of Aston the most, Martins I think. There. There's a record. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's the, on the bridge in Matera, there's the Maserati. And I when they when I first saw the trailer where they show, because they showed M with whatever that really high end sports car Aston is that's yeah. behind him. Yeah. I thought that might be because Maserati was coming out with a brand new supercar right at that time. So I thought that might have been that car, but it ended up being another Aston. So yeah, it just was just there as a, a yeah. product, say product placement. It wasn't yeah. there for any reason, was it? <laughs> what did you guys think of Blofeld? I liked him. I thought he was good. I thought he was he was perfect as as what he was from Spectre. So a believable continuation of that. And I liked the delivery of his lines. I thought his lines were delivered perfectly well and you could feel it you could feel him just being blowfilled and mm-hmm. there so i i was fine with him how about you vicky i i don't i didn't have an issue with him i mean i, I didn't like the the brother the brother thing inspector no, um, me neither i, I hate I, it I, I, I didn't think it worked <laughs> but i did enjoy the scene the conversation between mm-hmm. him and bond it was very subdued but yes. you know it was it was it was very well done and like it's just a shame, I suppose, that that character has possibly now gone, unless he does get brought back. But well, who knows? They, they, like Dan was saying, they have to go back. They could bring everyone back again because yeah, if because they're going to do any more of this thing, because they you know, can bring they can Goldfinger back. Both of those guys. <laughs> I like the Blofeld content here and the way it was acted. Yeah, especially yeah. given the stupid setup Purvis and Wade gave us in Spectre. Yes. <laughs> the whole brother thing. Yeah. But I actually, yeah. I actually really no, did. I actually did think it worked, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, what about Safin? Because we're on the, the villain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sort of, what's your thoughts? Okay. Safin, <laughs> to me, was not as flushed out a character as he should have been. I wasn't Rami's uh, fault. Right. I think they told him, this is what you're going to look like. This is what you're going to be like. This is how you're going to talk. And I thought that was a little, it was annoying almost the way he was talking and so low key and so whatever that this guy who wants to rule the world. Now, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible that somebody would be like that. I just didn't like the way it played off. And it's not Rami. Rami was good. It was what they made Safin do. That part, I was a little disappointed in. Really. So then are you not a Lane fan from the Mission Impossible series? Because he was another low-key, subdued, head villain guy. You know, sometimes it works. To me, this didn't work as well as it could have worked, I think. It wasn't bad. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't flushed out. It felt like, okay, I'm waiting for something else. And I didn't get the other something else. I was kind of waiting. <laughs> How about you, Vicky? At the very beginning... He got the mask on. He, you know, he was shooting. He, he, he was quite terrifying. It was like a slasher movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, yeah. It was. <laughs> I did like his performance. It, 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 it was very understated, very low key. But on the other hand, as well, I do think there was a lot more they could have done with the character. And I still, yeah. I'm sort of bemused as to why he let Matilda go. And he just seemed to be go. all very matter of fact. And, Her and eyes. He <laughs> see what he says. I have the same problem too. It's like, okay, I'm going. I'm killing your mother. Then he's going after the kid. He's looking for the kid. <laughs> he hears the cell phone ring and he's, uh now I could go kill her. And then she shoots him and all drags him out. And all of a sudden she's drowning. And yeah, he decides. Oh, those eyes are so cute. Ah, uh, yeah, I gotta save her. <laughs> I did. I did like him. It was just that bit that I just was couldn't quite work out what. <laughs> yeah. And that's the rest of the did, movie. Why he did that, and that after you know two or three viewings of that, I'm still on the wise of it. Well, I mean, he he wanted the possessor really at the end, right? He wanted the possessor. He wanted. He's, right. he's gonna let the kid go, but not Madeline. 
no, no, yeah. no, I'm keeping her. So I mean, he seemed quite at the very at the beginning. You know, he got that mask on. He got you know, he was shooting. He, he seemed, as I said, he seemed quite slasher, sort of you know, quite yeah. in your face sort of thing. And then we had the complete opposite later in the film when he was wasn't like that at all. So yeah, but you kind of saw a transition when he goes to Madeline supposedly for therapy. Yes. Right. He kind of transitions into you really realize how just nuts this guy is. And to me, that scene set Safin up very well for me. Mm. And, you know, again, at the end, although, Dan, I've got to say something. He just shot Bond. He walked in the room and started shooting him. Yeah. See, How many times do we say Bond... the villain should be shooting Bond? Yes, I like wouldn't, that. Wouldn't, <laughs> well, wouldn't Bond have been a bit more sort of, you know, he's gone into this garden with the pool. And a bit, a bit more aware of what's going on around him, rather you know, you know, he just got shot in the back. You know, it's like oh, so easy. Unbond like that's not fun. That's not fun. Unbond like, and the villain was unbond like because he just shot him, although he didn't finish him off because he had to give a speech. Yeah, yes, right. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, they, yeah. There you go, Tom. There you go. He didn't finish him off. Could have done it right then and there. But he started shooting him. Yeah, but and... you can't have Bond go just getting shot. <laughs> and that and, and that scene, and I thought the scene when he's clutching on to, Ma, to Matilda, and you know where Bond's apologizing or whatever, whatever setting up to pull out the gun. I, again, that was I I loved the character there. I thought that was really well done there. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I actually like Safin. I, I would I like to see more. Just that bit with me, I just couldn't work out why he basically let her go. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I do I do like him. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. he just he's just played very differently to. Possibly what I suppose because he, he's a bit like a megalomaniac. Yeah, well, yeah well, that's fine. Normally they're, play, they're played like golfing, you know, huge, but yeah. he's played at the opposite. Yeah. So, so he's quite, he's probably the creep, one of the creepiest villains. Yeah, yeah he is I'd creepy. Say. He is he's creepy. Yeah. And again, they had to have a villain that was disfigured and scarred. I mean, I'm a little tired of that. I mean, mm -hmm. there are people in the world, like Goldfinger, really, they didn't do that with Goldfinger. He was heavy and whatever, but. They, they didn't make him disfigured. Hey, don't don't knock heavy people. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but anyway, here's something that maybe is an issue here in this movie. Okay, after that whole chase scene in the beginning, and then he thinks she's betrayed him, and all of that, he puts her on the train, and says, "That's it. You'll never see me again. So don't worry about where I am or what I'm doing." To me, <laughs> wouldn't you spend some time? to try to get to the bottom of what happened here <laughs> as opposed to saying get on that train i'm never going to see you again i would think some discussion may I take place i don't agree with that <laughs> where have you ever seen him do that before i mean i actually thought that was very bond like it's like okay i'm done it, 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 you're, the, you're done the problem is it doesn't fit because it's Bond-like in one sense, but they've made him un-Bond-like throughout the movie, basically. And now he's going to be Bond-like when he throws her on the train and says, you're never going to see me again. I don't know really what the truth is. I have no idea what's going on here, but I'm never going to see you again. Goodbye. I, dis I dislike that tremendously. Of course, it would have been bad for the movie had they worked things out and he talked to her and everything else. That would have been bad. So, so that wasn't going to happen. But in real life, if you were going to do that, you'd think, okay, I better try to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of getting to the bottom, I forgot this. When we were talking about Blofeld, one part of that scene I really liked where, where Bond, he ends up killing him, but it, not because of the strangling. But die Blofeld, die and strangling Blofeld, mm -hmm. that is right out of the novel, yeah. You Only Live yeah. Twice. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, that was another one of those tip of the cap things that yeah. I forgot I was going to mention on the Blofeld thing. I just saw it in my notes. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that part, that kind of stuff is great. I love when they actually take stuff from Fleming because we're so far from Fleming now with anything they've done that it's nice when they have these connections back to Fleming because that's really where this came from. And that part is good. There's actually at the end, we'll, we'll talk about when we talk about the, the real end of this thing, is there's a quote in there that, again, was pulled out of You Only Live Twice, mm -hmm. word for word. So we'll talk about that mm -hmm. in a little bit. Yes. While we're actually on that train scene, of course, that then leads into the theme song and the title sequence. Yes. What What are your thoughts on, on that, um, you know, how that played out? 
uh, the I title loved, sequence. I loved that title sequence, especially in 3D. It was mm-hmm. unbelievable in 3D. Yeah, I didn't see it in 3D, but I liked it. I agree. I liked it. I don't have any problems with the title sequence at all. There were a lot of throwbacks in the title sequence, too, with yeah. the, the trident yeah. and, and everything. And the song worked perfectly well with mm-hmm. everything. You yeah. know, I mean, it, you know, it, yeah. it fits with the film. It fits with the style of film. So. And you could understand the words. <laughs> yes, you could understand Unlike the words. when which, they first released yeah. it to us. Which is terrific. And yes. because <laughs> what there are... I, there's still some issues with the song that I, I have. I'm having a lot of issues here. I should see Madeline Swan for <laughs> <laughs> counseling. <laughs> uh, I mean, who 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 betrayed who in that song? And, and who's, I, I fell for a lie. Who's lie and who lied? I still am confused about that twice. And, you know, I fell, I fell for it twice. It's like, okay, before the movie came out you could imagine lots of things mm. well, tying it back to the movie thing, only having seen the, the they'd only seen the pre-title sequence they'd only they? seen the pre-title when yeah, they wrote then, that song yeah. so mm. it makes right. sense for that because right no i'm i'm saying that but i'm saying for yeah. the movie now when i'm thinking about what the lyrics are because i like to do that if you're gonna have lyrics to a a song for the movie then mm. you're looking for these connections in the lyrics to the movie I mean that's what you should do. That's that's what you should do. And and so here there's there's some disconnects that I still I still don't get. Do, do you guys get it? I don't. I don't. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one who needs counseling. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that often about you, Dan. <laughs> You're not the first. <laughs> You're partnering with me on this project. <laughs> that says that something. Give you a clue right there. <laughs> anyway. And I saw the, another aspect is the return of the of, of M and Q and mm-hmm. uh, Money Penny, and and I actually thought out of all the Daniel Craig films that these guys have been in that these they were the best in this particular film. I'm not a fan of Money Penny, Naomi Harris's version of Money Penny, yes. but I did think she was better in this film because she was back where she should be. Yes, because <laughs> yeah. we know what she's like when she's in the field. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Yeah, she wasn't very <laughs> yeah. good shot. And uh, wasn't very good in the field, so that's good. I thought M in this was terrific. Mm-hmm. Ray Fiennes is really good. Ray yeah, Fiennes was yeah, terrific. Yeah. He his facial expressions when he's talking to Bond, his facial expressions at the end where he knows what's going on, and you know he knows that right. this mm-hmm. is it. Ah, oh, he, he was yeah. terrific. He was awesome. Yeah. And I, and I'm I gonna say Q. Q was terrific. I, I like this I guy as Q. Ben Wishaw's portrayal. I do too. Of Q. Ben. Ben. He's this smart little kid. I mean, he's not a kid, but he, he compared to Desmond. Yeah, and, and I love him. I, was, I wish he could continue as cute. I, I Barbara love and Michael. Very believable. As you go forward, if you go forward with more of these movies, bring him back as Q. James Bond he's, will return. He, I've got to be honest with you. It's one of his moments that I find funniest in the film, and every time I've watched it, I've laughed as much as I did the first time. It's when they, he pulls the drawer open and the tea set's in there. That creases me every time. <laughs> I think that's really funny. Well, and, <laughs> but and I never got, noticed he got his pajamas on. I, must yeah, yeah. I love his I whole apartment scene. That. The whole apartment scene thing is great. Well, you've got the bald cat, which is reminiscent yeah. of Austin Powers. Right. right? Yes. Uh, so I think it's a little tip of the cap to Austin Powers portrayal mm-hmm. there. But even things like when they're in the, whatever you call the bunker thing at the end, and he's saying, okay, it's the sigh when they're trying to point out when they're saying which one's Bond. Yeah, he right. says, it's the sigh. He <laughs> says, the trident thingy. I love that because yeah. it's like, okay, you guys aren't going to understand this. Yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> he, he could be yeah. demeaning while being funny at the same time, which was great. Yeah, his yeah, character was, is great. Yeah. yeah, he was really good in this one. Yeah, yeah he yeah. does and a great he's job. He's been good in all of them, but I really thought he stood out. Yeah. <laughs> for me yeah. in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to shift gears here and ask a question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why didn't Primo die with everyone else from Spectre at Blofeld's birthday party? He's obviously part of Spectre, or did the henchmen not die? It was it just the principals? No, no, I... How did he survive that? He, he's a Saffin guy, isn't he? Wasn't he, was he a, like a sort of a double... No, he was a, he was a Blofeld solid? guy. <laughs> I thought he was a Blofeld guy. What's he doing there with Saffin at the end? Yeah, I, I got confused because he had the same eye as Blow. I just assumed. Yeah, yeah. He has the same and, eye as Blofeld, and I think 
And at the beginning at the graveyard and stuff like that, it's all based off of this whole this whole thing of Blofeld setting that up. Yeah, that's true. I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, he, his character confused me. I liked the performance. I thought it was great. Yeah. But the the character confused me because it's like, who is he? How did he is not this, die? There's a scene when they're trying to locate Logan Ash, and he doesn't he go up to Primo, uh, like it's a, like a, a cafe outside. He, he makes a, Logan Ash makes a comment to him yes. saying, I'm trying to think what the line is. I can't remember exactly what the line was, but I, I, I didn't know if he was just sort of like, Working sort of on, on both sides somehow. I don't know. Yeah, it was confusing. Sure. It's it, explained, it, it, it is confusing, and I'm glad you brought that up, Tom, because uh, I'm mm. still confused as to who he worked for. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you, you would think it was Spectre, but he didn't die, and all of Spectre is dead. That's what mm-hmm. they said. Now, including Blofeld, Blofeld, they said was the last one. Right. So, so he couldn't have been a Spectre guy, but. He's got or the eye. Not a specter agent is a henchman, not an agent, so they didn't get whatever this. I, I don't know. Yeah, it just confused it's me. Not clear. It's not clear. Yeah. All right. So there's All one right. unclear well, thing. <laughs> All right. So now we've been going along, trying to avoid talking the ending. Well, let's go ahead and jump into the because I think we have kind of covered our thoughts mm-hmm. throughout. Let's talk about the ending. I thought the action scene in that whole thing was very well done and the explosions and the fights and the Ken Adams kind of sets and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But well, then you have thingy? Bond turning sappy again. Well, yeah, you're going to have you're going to have a lot of sap. More mm-hmm. sap than a maple tree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the end there. And he kept repeating himself throughout this thing. I know, I know. Um and you know, Hey, those are the last he, words of Bond. Yeah, I know, but he but it's he repeated himself probably 10 or 15 times throughout this movie. The problem when he said, I know, I know, it just reminded me of Star Wars when Han Solo was being frozen into that block. And 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 Leia says to him, I love you. And he says, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and then he gets frozen. It, and I couldn't get over that. Of, it reminded me of, uh, I hate Armageddon. I cannot bear that film. And it's it's a reason, I think, because you've got Bruce Willis speaking to Liv Tyler and she's going, Daddy, don't do it and all this. And (laughs) it was, he had to speak to Madeline the same. I just kept thinking of Armageddon. Armageddon. It was all very, just just all sort of, well, just sappy and over, sort of like, no, 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 it just wasn't, it just wasn't Bond. Yeah. And I think I got upset, I'll be honest, I didn't, I didn't on the others the first time I did, but I don't know if I, now, thinking maybe I was upset because I was surprised what they'd done, <laughs> more so than what was going on. Yeah. The I second time around, you, you do get a better perspective of the entire scene unfolding, which is good, mm. but you still have the ending, and it didn't change in the uh, on-demand uh, viewing. <laughs> No. And, and, it's not like the movie Clue where they put it out with different versions. Yeah, I like that better. Versions, yeah. I have some <laughs> issues with this uh, whole last scene. Num- number one is why are they sending Nomi and Bond only against virtually an army of people that they know are going to be there? That's a problem. And number two, mm-hmm. because they did that, Nomi had to leave with Madeline and Matilde because they didn't want to put them on the boat alone, apparently. Although Madeline seemed pretty, you know, pretty capable with guns and stuff, so she could, probably could have driven the boat to the next little island. But they leave Bond there again alone to fight an enormous number of people he had to go kill on his own. One bullet in him, and the whole thing would have fallen apart. The whole, the whole plan. No, it did. Yeah, no, I mean the whole plan to eradicate Heracles would have fallen oh, yeah. apart if they had just one bullet hit Bond and he's alone now. That's a problem that I thought was totally unrealistic. Well, he and often worked alone though, Dan. I think that was in keeping to Bond. He does. He did, but he wasn't in this movie working alone. That's the problem. So why would you send in two people and then have one leave and leave Bond there and say, well, all of our hopes are on this guy now that he's going to turn back into Bond <laughs> and actually this whoever he was. finish this off. That's yeah. a problem. And I have a problem at the very end, too, that he did what he did. Because you, you got Q in his ear telling him, hey, no, you got this, you got this thing forever. Mm-hmm. And you have him now 
understanding from Safin that, oh, hey, you can't ever see your wife and kid again. And this is when he realizes it for the first time, is when, right, right before Safin dies, right? That Bond realizes that, oh, yeah, shit, I got this stuff. And I, hey, Q, when does this go away? When can I, oh, you can't get rid of that Bond. Number one, I thought that was a bad idea for Q to be telling him that. Number two, Q should have been telling him, hey, you know, hang in there, Bond. Science created this problem, and science may figure out a way to get around this problem, stay alive, get off the island, and so on. My last problem with this is, <laughs> I got to go see Madeline. My last problem with this is, why the hell did they have to launch the missiles now? <laughs> there was no impending doom, no impending reason. The well, no, they, they had the they had the boats coming to pick up. The, you know how the, easy that would be to take care of two boats. He's like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I got naval ships around there, and you got two little gun runner boats mm -hmm. that are going to take off drugs. I'll sink those in minutes after you're off the island. That's not an issue. I think they set it up like that for us to think it. Oh, they're twenty minutes away. They're fifteen minutes away. Oh my god. Oh my god. My god. No, you got a freaking navy on your side <laughs> versus two boats. <laughs> And so, no, that was a failure, total failure, I think, on their part. Bond could See, have gotten off the island. Politically, if they went after those boats, if those people that were behind those boats were high-powered people, they would have, which they probably would have, they could have had a political mess. They've got a political mess already, but it's easier to say we blew up the island where all this crap was than we got these guys who we think were going to pick this up. And, oh, yeah, they might have been really, you know, they might have been billionaires that are very well politically connected. You, you could have and had was votes. talking about how he had a political problem on his hands. Yeah, with yeah, he does, have a, he does have a political problem. And, and that was the battle between Bond and him. Launch the missiles now versus M saying, we can't launch the missiles at all. That's basically what they were arguing about. And then M gives in. It's like, oh, okay, launch the missiles now, I guess. It's like, Whoa, wait a minute. So I don't, I don't buy any of that. I don't buy the boats. I don't buy the political crap. He's already deep in political crap because of what he did, M. This mm -hmm. is his problem, as Bond told him. You created this problem, so mm -hmm. now you have to end it. So ah, the whole thing of Bond not getting off the island and and hoping that science might fix this thing, I think is poor. I think they wanted, obviously, they wanted to show us he's, he's gone. And they made it pretty clear. I read an article. You don't think he got blown off the island and you know, he's going to surface somewhere else? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know for sure. Because <laughs> that was what I said to you, Vicky, when we first saw it. I was like, oh, maybe that's what they're doing here. After yeah. five times, I don't believe that anymore. Well, the problem, <laughs> no. the, the, the issue with fiction and science fiction, like Leonard Nimoy said when he died in Star Trek, and then they, the next movie is The Search for Spock, <laughs> yeah. and he's brought back to life. He, you know, Leonard Nimoy says, well, the good thing is in science fiction, no one ever dies. <laughs> and it's the same thing in fiction. No one ever really dies in James fiction. James Bond is not fiction, Dan. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I forgot. You're right. <laughs> so the same thing with fiction, right? All you have to do is write it, and it's done. Mm -hmm. So you, they could do whatever the hell they want. They've trapped themselves, though, and I think that's the problem. Eon has put themselves oh, in a I corner. Think we've seen Bond escape from so many islands that are about to blow up in the past. I think, yes. you know, we, he needs to escape and just to stand there and just wait for them to hit. Uh, it, 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 See, well, I go back to the he knows he can't leave because he's been infected. And if he leaves the island, eventually Matilda and Madeline will die from this thing. I'm and not just, clear just, on that. And yeah, I'm not that was why that was why they were saying it's eternal, why you can't get rid of it. And when M is explaining how how brilliant this whole concept of Heracles was, he was saying it can go to all these people who will never get it, but eventually it'll get to the person you want. With the right modifications and the right whatever right. they but said, suppose, it could be suppose, you could you could wipe out ethnicities. They were talking about yeah, but, but he was talking about p picking off individual villains with this thing that you could get everybody around them infected and it won't do anything to them. Right. And, and I think, okay, James has the thing that's now going to get Matilda and Madeline. Mm. If he leaves the Island, eventually that thing's going to come around to them and kill them. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, that's, I'm that's not how sure. I interpret it. I'm not sure of that. And I'm not sure of why you wouldn't put your faith in science to come up with a solution. They came no, up with, with this. I agree, I agree with you. And there. that's what Q should have been putting in yeah. his ear. 
Hey, and hang in there, Bond. Fine, we'll yeah, isolate yeah. you if we have to. We'll do what we have to do. We'll keep you alive. We'll work on this. Maybe M and his scientists <laughs> can yes, figure I out a way out. I agree with you on that totally. Yeah. This is quite controversial, but do you think that in the end that Barbara and uh, Michael have made Daniel Craig bigger than the actual film? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I, yeah, I, I uh, think I, I, I think they deferred to him and they said to themselves, no one else could be Bond after Daniel. Yeah. I think they really think this, that, yeah. hey, and, no yeah, one I could follow really this. Yeah. And, and, and the, let's and the, kill him. And the, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the problem I have is, if they hadn't talked him into coming back, yeah. this movie would not have, that ending would never yeah, have happened. He shouldn't have come back. Yeah. It's yes. like if Purvis and Wade weren't writing, and if and if he had said if both of those things which were supposed to have happened don't happen, we don't have this problem. That's right, yeah. 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 And it makes okay, you so wonder what the hell happened with Danny Boyle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when everyone the rumor was then he wanted to kill off Bond and everyone was like, Yeah, you're crazy, yes. get out of here. Well, maybe it's the way he wanted to do it or something. I don't know. Um, uh, so let's let's close and we, we've been going for a while here so let's kind of close out a little bit here we've got two more scenes to talk about mm -hmm. we have the scene that they rip off of the kingsman which is the toast at the end yeah and that's oh, where yeah. they do the jack london quote i shall not waste my days trying to prolong them i shall use my time which again came right out of a fleming book yep i kind of think it that you know the whole toasting thing is very kingsman it was a Kingsman, the Secret Service was the first one you see that in. I think this is very similar to that, as well as that quote kind of almost being in the, you know, manners maketh the man speech that happens, or the comment that happens in the Kingsman. I kind of felt the, the, that out of this. I don't know what you guys think of the toast scene. I love the toast scene because, well, although I thought, boy, it was pretty limited uh, number of people toasting there because, you know, it's a big organization, MI6. But that's the big crew. That's the main crew. <laughs> I know, but... <laughs> it's mm. like it seemed a little funny mm. but anyway i love that his the bonds drink was sitting on the table and at the end they mm -hmm. clink his glass mm -hmm. i like that i thought mm -hmm. that was good the quote i thought was okay th this is our setup for why we we had him killed and uh and 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 you people out there should understand this now but, but it's it, also how bond lived but if, if they had they didn't do the whole quote I, right. I, I, they just said the proper function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I right. shall use my time. That's all they said, right? Right. And, but, that, and that's but, how Bond lived his life. Yeah. But I mean, the full quote actually makes more sense had they quoted the full quote. And the full quote was from, of course, Jack London, who Fleming has the quote in his, like you said, Tom. Right. I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze then it should be stifled by dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. The proper function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. All of this imagery in the full <laughs> quote, you get when he's blowing up at the end, right? Yes, yeah, the I'll dust, just, the yeah, meteor, the whole yeah. flame thing. I think they should have done the whole quote. It's probably too well, long my, already, the my, movie. My guess is they probably recorded the whole thing and then thought it was too long, but I agree with you. When you hear that yeah, whole thing, yeah. that, do... that puts things in, in context. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree there. Yeah. Okay, the last shot. We yeah. got Madeline and Matilda in the car. I don't know if I've said this, but I have a problem with that. And <laughs> <laughs> really? she's, the, she's the one who says Bond, James Bond. Yeah. And when I saw that mm. the second time, I didn't, I didn't think this the first, the first time I was just so wrapped up in this whole thing. Yeah. 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 That's but right. The, yeah. se the second time I saw that, I'm like, Oh my God, they're going to pull a Bob Newhart or a Newhart ending. Now, Vicki, I don't know if you guys got the Newhart show on TV <laughs> over there, but at the okay. end, the last, so Bob Newhart was a character who played a psychiatrist in one show called the Bob Newhart show. Yeah. Then he came to an innkeeper not playing the same person that was called Newhart. Yeah. And at the end of Newhart, when they finished that show up, the last part of that is the wife from the first one. Suzanne Plachette. Because in the first one, she was in bed with him a lot and they were talking. They they were like, oh my God, Bob, I just had this dream. <laughs> and is, and I'm going to really be pissed if the whole, let me tell you a story about a man, Bond, James Bond, 
if that is the Suzanne Plachet, I mean, it worked great for Newhart, but if they're doing that to try to say this whole Daniel Craig thing was Madeline's story made up for her kid, I'm going to really be pissed. I don't think that's going to happen, but I would be pissed too. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? I I have a problem here. (laughs) (laughs) I think this was their way the writer's way, Barbara's way, and Michael's way of telling us, here is how we're going to continue this story of Bond, because we just killed him. Yet, they said Bond, James Bond shall return, right? So, it's going to be Madeline, or some version of this, telling stories about James Bond's past. So, all we could do, all they can do, because they painted themselves in a corner, is come up with stories about James Bond's past because he's dead. <laughs> and now she, they're telling us here, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay, so uh, hang on. I'm, I'm spacing on the name. What's the one that, that uh, was that, where the book was a third party telling the story? Vivian. Oh, Which that was, was uh, that was The Spy Who Loved Me, I thought. Yeah, Spy Who Loved Me. Right. So you're saying that this, thing's, this whole series is going to just turn into Spy Who Loved Me? people just telling stories about him there, there's they, they can do nothing else they, they either resurrect him which if they resurrect bond and like you said tom he got blown off the island and he's floating down and he lands in the yellow raft uh <laughs> which he always does at the end of movies escaping from islands they have another problem because he's old and retired so now you resurrect bond that he survived this thing they have another problem He's old and retired. Now what do you do? How do you get the next Bond younger and not retired? That's a problem. If they don't do that, he's dead. That makes anything they do in the future Bond's past. They're going to go back to when he's recruited by MI6. They're going to go back to when he's a commander in the Navy. What are they going to do? Maybe they bring the young James Bond novels to life. Well, they, that, that's what I'm saying. But that's all yeah. past, right? It's all in the past. Yeah. And that's what they've trapped themselves into doing now. Yeah. I just think it'll just get rebooted. I, I think you, well, I, I just see this as an isolated series of films of just of, of Daniel with Daniel Craig yeah. as Bond. And I think it'll just go back to perhaps revert to what it, what it was before. I think it'll just be re- rebooted again. I, there seems to be a lot of things rebooted and we just seem to accept them and, you know, how many times has Halloween been rebooted? Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> However, I have a problem. <laughs> no. no. Not you, Dan. <laughs> uh, I, I think the whole reboot concept is, again, flawed because now you've, you've, you're have you telling a story about James Bond in any of these movies. You just, you just killed him. You just killed him off. We saw mm-hmm. him die. So you're trapped. You can reboot all you want. We know, oh, he might survive this mission that they rebooted in 1966, but we know he doesn't survive the last mission. He's dead. And I think that's going to taint some people's view of the future. The invincibility is not there. Yeah, right. Now you know he's Mm -hmm. dead. He's not going to survive again. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same like a continuing story any longer. We know the end. He's dead. And and that that kind of ruins things for a lot of people. we, We know the story for everyone is they're dead. Right, event. That, that's the only truth we have in life. Yeah, but we don't need to know it for Bond, and and, and then now come up with more movies where we're supposed to get excited about it. Yeah, I, I think they're going to. Obviously, they're going to. They're not going to, you know, kill off a seven, eight, nine billion dollar franchise. <laughs> yeah, but they have some challenges now. And well, I think now the, the other key. the other part of that, if you look at the other way, the money really started go- ramping up when these became more action movies than. Yeah, and spy movies, movies, right? And so, you know, is that part of the problem too? Is it hard for, can they go back to the spy stuff over the action because action's where the money's at? Yeah, I know. It is an issue. Yep. (laughs) What do you think there, Vicky? I just don't think, (laughs) there was no other way, what other way was it to end this arc? I, I I don't agree with how it ended, but what other way is the, that they could have done that he drove off into the sunset with his with Madeline and the the kid because then we've got 
whatever comes after that, exactly. what happens about them. So that's exactly right. It's just a vicious circle. They trap themselves. That's what I'm saying. They trap <laughs> themselves. He can't survive because then you have that. You have Madeline yeah, and a kid. Do do? What do they do with that? And yeah, he's it, old it, and retired. You, 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 so you can't resurrect well, yeah, him. Yeah, but see, for, for that one, you can actually fairly easily take care of that with a villain taking him out, like they did with Tracy, right? Because all of a sudden, you know, in on Her Majesty's, he was married. And then now what the hell are you going to do? So yeah. the villain takes him out. You could do the same thing. Now, it's it's easier to take out Madeline than a kid. I actually thought that's what was going to happen, actually, in this film. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before we even saw it, I thought that they would go along those lines, not that it would be him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought Felix was going to go and maybe Madeline and not him. Mm. But yeah. but even if they did that, Tom, and they take out uh, Madeline and they figure out how to take out a kid, he's still old and retired. And right. that's you know, and that's where they painted themselves in the well, corner. Well, that's the problem because they did these continuations yep. Yep. where prior to Daniel, each thing was its own thing. There might have been a reference to an older one. Yeah, yeah. But it was each thing was its own individual mission. Yeah, yeah individual mission, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 And that's what I liked. That was yeah. good. And me. And me. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So as much as I as I like Casino Royale and I still think mm -hmm. that's a brilliant film uh, of Daniel Craig's, I don't think any of the others are a patch on that. Well, that was because it was go. based off the book. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. yeah that, that, it was uh, just so well done. Just... So I, I started this talking about how I thought this was a good action movie and a terrible Bond movie. Mm. And I think through this, this podcast, I've expressed why I think that. And it sounds like you guys have similar thoughts to that to kind of wrap this up. Yeah, I think it's difficult to rank to, to, to rank where this one sits in the in terms yeah. of, of films. I mean, I'm probably mid-table with it because the, there is stuff that I do really like in it, um, but there's stuff that I don't like at all in yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I suppose, really, the, it's difficult to rank it because it's so different to anything else that we've, yeah. we've got. It's such yeah. a different film, so it might not ever be, have, a, have a rank from me. But yeah, it'll I certainly, agree. certainly not one to trouble the top ten anyway. Yeah, I agree. Won't, so won't you have bother this my one, top ten. You have Spectre. Some people will say Skyfall. You have Quantum. You have mm -hmm. Die Another Day. What are those five movies which are, cons in my mind, considered towards the bottom of the Bond barrel? Not necessarily the last ones, but towards the bottom. They're all written by Purvis and Wade. Uh -huh. <laughs> those guys. Yeah. All right. My my whole conclusion of this entire movie is is this. My name was Bond, James Bond. I don't know who I was in this movie. <laughs> was is, was is the key word. My name was Bond, James Bond. How about you? Any last thoughts, Vicky? I'm just thinking. When I watch it again, will I have any? You know, will anything change, or will it, will it will will it get even more negative? You know, because it started off quite positive, right? And then well, you know, and watch it again. Unusual, and, that's unusual yeah. for me on these movies because, like Quantum, yeah. I, I like wasn't it more. wild about. I like Quantum more the more I've seen it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so and this one's exactly the opposite. Yeah. 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 Well, there's mm -hmm. no getting over the end. All right. This has been going on long enough, so that's a wrap. This has been Tom Pizzato. I'm Dan Silvestri. I'm Vicky Hodges. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Please remember to subscribe to our show right now. Check out our videos on Cracking the Code of the Spy Movies YouTube channel as well as on your favorite podcast app with the same name. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. And we welcome you to join our private Facebook group, the worldwide community of spy movie fans. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it.